Lord, thank you for Psalm 48. And I would ask that you might use it for your glory, that we might be encouraged, rebuked, and corrected, and rejoiced that we were able to go through Psalm 48. So come, Spirit of God, help us. Use uh, my mind at this time. Guide, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're on Psalm 48, and uh, I have, um, I'm like J. Vernon McGee, I guess. Whatever Psalm I, am, I am uh, studying, it's my favorite, I guess. And so uh, it is in the second um, volume of what we call the five volumes of the Psalter. And let me just give you a brief introduction. Uh, Psalm 48 is a song of Zion. Um, in other words, it is a praise psalm that speaks uh, about God being in Zion. And this psalm magnifies the city of Jerusalem because the Lord chose this city to make His name known. And in the Old Testament, the Lord chose to make His name known and proclaim His name to the nations by choosing Zion, which is called Jerusalem, and manifesting His temple there, and was also to draw the nations to it. So in the Old Testament, God made uh, a city His, uh, his uh, place of dwelling, specifically the temple, and He was drawing nations to it. Uh, in the New Testament, the Lord has chosen to indwell His church and then send us out to the nations. So it's a different kind of dispensation. The central message of the psalm centers around the good news of God's presence, and only because of the Lord's presence was Zion considered beautiful and secure. In other words, it would have been just any other city. It's because the Lord chose it. And the church used the psalm in worship, especially on Whit Sunday. Now, I don't know if you've heard of Whit Sunday. I didn't know much about Whit Sunday. But it's the same thing as Pentecost, for Jerusalem was the beginning uh, of the church in Acts 2. And so <clears throat> often they used in celebration Psalm. 48. Well, with that introduction, let's look at the outline. Uh, again, in three points, there is a praise in verses 1 through 3, the victory for Zion in 4 through 8, and then an internal praise, I call it, in verses 9 through 14. All right, let's begin the psalm dealing with praise. And you will notice in verse 1, it says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, His holy mountain. Matter of fact, that has been put into a song. And every time I begin to read that, I hear this scripture song that is sung in my head. But notice it's bringing praise to the great God. And notice, I uh, don't point this out often, but I think it's worth looking at here. Uh, the word Lord here, uh, in all capitals in the New American Standard Bible, is uh, indicating that this, in the Hebrew text, is the title Yahweh, which uh, there may be many gods, Elohims, even, but there's only one Yahweh. And notice also in this text, it also says the city of our God, Elohim. And what we find here is the word Lord, Yahweh, is used uh, twice in this text. And the word God is used eight times. Now, to break it out a little bit further, you will notice that in verse 1, you have both Lord and God put together. And then you have in verse 8, which is the end of a section here, 
uh, you have both the Lord and God twice. And then at the end of the psalm, you don't have Lord, but you have God used twice in the text. So where God is used twice, you have an ending. Ending of a section, if you notice, even the, uh, they put Selah there. Pause and consider possibly its interpretation. And then the ending of the psalm using God twice. And just like in the English text, it's in the Hebrew text. Elohim, Elohim is used. It's usually Elohim, El, uh, Eloheinu. Uh, so um, uh, they put there together. Now let's look from that outline. Let's look at the who, what, where. It's interesting that this verse brings, for, brings this out. The who, of course, is the Lord Yahweh. Uh, and then what is greatly to be praised, not just praised, but greatly to be praised. This is uh, in this phrase, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, is a chiastic arrangement of that phrase. You say chiastic, what does that mean? Well, look at an X. If you notice, great was used, and then Lord, and then great um, uh, and then God. So uh, it's somewhat of a chiastic relationship. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Where? God's city, which would be Jerusalem. So he is now magnifying a specific place for which they are to, to greatly praise. And verse 2 is the city of the great king. So this great Lord has now become the great king in verse 2. It's beautiful in elevation. Well, that's why they call it, um, if we ever get there, if that's what the Lord wants. And when we get to some of the Psalms in the past 100, <laughs> There is what is called the ascent psalm. So when three times the, uh, the Jewish man was required to ascend to Jerusalem for a feast, they would sing the ascent psalms because everybody goes up at the elevation when you approach Jerusalem. So high in elevation, uh, the joy of the whole earth. Now, the... The reason why it's beautiful uh, and the reason why it's in, uh, they are saying it's elevated, it's not the highest spot in, in Jerusalem, I mean in, in Israel, but it's an elevation because God is there. So we have a physical beauty because heaven and earth meets there. That's what a Jewish person would say. God came down and he dwelt in Jerusalem, so heaven and earth meet together there, they would call it. It is global because notice the joy of the whole earth. If they would just recognize that God dwelt there, it would be the joy of the whole earth. So you have global here. And finally, the location, it says there, Mount Zion in what is called the far north. Now, that's strange because... If you know your geography of Israel, uh, it, uh, Jerusalem is not in the far north. Um, you would say uh, it's not even necessarily north. You say, so what is it speaking about? Well, we don't know for sure, but it's a possibility. The Hebrew word zaphon is the word north or far north. And so I gave you in your notes, you'll notice there, and let me read it to you. Um, the Ugaritic text, which is a, an, a Semitic a language that is likened unto Hebrew. It's not Hebrew, but it comes from a family. Ugaritic text indicated that the literal Zaphon, which we call the far north, is Mount Cassias or Zebel uh, El uh, Akra. Uh, Baal's mountain. In other words, you know, the, the gods of Baal. 
that's where they said that he dwelt, in the highest peak of the far north of what we would call Syria, Palestine. Uh, so hence, Zaphon comes to be a term for the north. And the claim that Mount Zion is Zaphon's height is thus laughable as a comment about a physical geography, but it makes another theological statement, if this is correct. The psalm knows that Yahweh, not Baal, is the real sovereign power in heaven and on earth, and the mountain where Yahweh lives is therefore much more important place than the mountain where Baal lives and is the real impressive mountain and the real thing of which Mount Zaphon is a shadow. So that is a possible explanation of why they call it the far, <coughs> the far north or north. Now there may be other reasons or other, other ways that you could interpret that but I didn't get to investigate that in great detail. So the far north may be because they're looking at it and it's a theological statement, not a geographical statement. Okay? Now, second, what? The city of the great king. Everyone owes their allegiance to the great king. And so... Um, God is in her, uh, I mean, in her palace, and he has made himself known as a stronghold, a defense, one that, um, uh, since he is there, I may I ask you a question. How in the world could anybody destroy the city if God is in it? The answer is they couldn't. You say, well, it was destroyed in A.D. 70. Yes, because it was destroyed in 586 B.C. Yes, because they were disobedient. And you will read in the book of Ezekiel, that is um, uh, 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 one of the um, themes that I trace when I teach the book of Ezekiel, how the glory of God departs from Jerusalem. Why? How could they destroy the temple if God doesn't leave? Well, they couldn't. But the temple was destroyed in 586 because God left. So what we're saying here from this text is God is in this city. He has made himself known and, um, and has manifest himself in one particular spot more than any other. So even though God, uh, the Jewish people knew that God was everywhere, he was also manifested in a very specific uh, place in Jerusalem in the temple. So, they're praising God for him who dwells in Zion. All right. Now, in verses 4 through 8, we see the victory for Zion. The praise the Lord for this victory and establish Zion as his city forever. Notice, uh, I, I didn't put this in your notes. I added it this morning. Every time I read the psalm, I add something. I'm sorry. Um, it says four in verse four. So therefore, he's making an explanation of why God is saying Zion is the city. For lo, the kings assemble uh, themselves. So the king is making his... Um, manifestation in Zion and the kings are assembling to go against him. So the kings will attack the city and when they attack the city they are attacking God. Now I hope you uh, as you read the Old Testament I, there, there is a tendency at least for me when I first read it and read it for many years that Israel must be just an unbelievable warrior. I know God was with them, but they must be really good and very uh, 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 tactful in, in, in how they did war. And that may be true, maybe not, but that wasn't the big factor. The big factor was God was with them. And notice when they were disobedient or they didn't call upon him, uh, 
to uh, help them in the, vict in, in the battle, they didn't win. So it's not that they had such great tactics, I'm not saying they didn't, that caused them to win, but it was because God was with them. He was protecting them. Matter of fact, he said, if you obey me, and, uh, then I will give you victory. If you disobey me, you, get, you don't get the victory. So uh, the kings began to attack the city. Uh, I think it's just uh, bringing forth a generic uh, understanding that that's what the, uh, the heathens would do. And the result is, is that God would protect the city and the kings would flee in defeat. So notice, uh, the kings saw, they were amazed, they were terrified, and then they fled in alarm. That's verse 5. And so, notice the image that is brought out in verse 6. The word panic can also be the word trembling. So they tremble uh, in, in, uh, as they would see that God is protecting the city. They seize them there. The trembling is anguish as a woman in childbirth. So two images, one of a sheer panic where people are trembling and, and fleeing, and the second image is the pain of it all like a woman going through childbirth. Now, men, I'm sorry, we don't know that. We can only look on with uh, uh, outward uh, understanding, but women would understand that kind of pain. And then the illustration, so we had two images and an illustration here, and in verse 7, that illustration, it says, with the great wind, you uh, break the ships of Tarshish. Well, again, that you have to know the, the period of time and the, the, uh, uh, well, the strongest and the largest ships were from Tarshish as a typical rule. And so they, uh, he brings this up. They would know that and these ships are destroyed. This demonstrates God's mighty power to defeat the enemy, whether it is on the land or is on the sea. And... This is the result of God's protection. The king, the great king, dwells in Zion, and the kings that go against it are destroyed. And then it ends, uh, this section, with the result of God's action. Jerusalem will be the dwelling place of God forever. Notice, um, I have it circled the entire verse in my Bible. As we have heard, so we have seen. In the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will, uh, will establish her, the city, forever. Now, if you will think back on the history of Jerusalem, you say, well, that doesn't seem to be true. Well, the answer to that question, as we're going to go through here, is that history isn't over yet. Now, I realize uh, the city of Jerusalem was kept for many years, many decades, until the time of after Solomon, and the breaking it up in 722 B.C. as the northern kingdom goes off into captivity by the Assyrians. And then in 586, we see the, the uh, southern kingdom taken to Babylon, and they were brought back under the Persians and rebuilt the temple, and, and yet they were the Persians were conquered by the Greeks, and then the Greeks by the Romans, and we come in the time of the year of our Lord who comes up upon the scene, and the Romans are under it, and there is a huge temple. Matter of fact, Herod makes it a, a, a wonder of the world of the temple in Jerusalem. And then because of the disobedience of, our, uh, of the nation, of rejecting their Messiah Jesus in AD 70, they're scattered to the four corners of the earth. 
and did not come back into uh, a nation uh, that's in a land until May 14th of 1948. And yet still, um, there is wars uh, happening in Jerusalem. Not right now, right? But so it really, he hasn't established Jerusalem yet. And that comes in the future restoration at the second coming of Christ. So Jerusalem will be established forever, or that phrase could be until eternity, but yet it hasn't happened yet. It happens at his second coming. Now I could turn, you, turn to Revelation chapter 20, where we see the second coming of Christ, the setting up the millennial kingdom, and then uh, the judgment at the end of the tribulation, um, excuse me, in the millennial kingdom and into the new heavens and new earth in Revelation 21 and 22. But I want to stay in the Old Testament. And I have I've turned to these passages before when we've uh, studied uh, certain Psalms, but it's worth coming back together. So hold your place in the Psalms and turn over to the prophet Isaiah. And we'll go into chapter 2. And again, remember, the context is the victory for Zion, God establishing Zion as the city forever. And um, we see that Isaiah does that. In Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1, um, the word which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah, and there it is, Jerusalem. Now, it will come about that in the last days, that's a phrase that's often used in the prophets to, to catapult you to the time of the tribulation period, that seven-year uh, period of hell on earth that will cl uh, uh, climax in the second coming of Christ and setting up the kingdom. Now, it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. Now, when it uses the mountains, it's not only looking at a geographical aspect, but it's looking at it as his kingdom, the place where the capital of his city will be. He will be raised up above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. I often tell people, uh, from AD 70 to 1948, did anybody stream to Did all the nations stream to Jerusalem? I would, they would say, well, what for? There was nothing there. Well, in 1948, uh, two years before I was born, um, the nation came into existence. Have all the nations been streaming to Jerusalem? The answer to that question is no. Well, it, well why? Because it's still yet to come. So, verse 3 of Isaiah 2, and many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain to the, uh, uh, of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. There's when it will happen. And he will judge between the nations, and he will render decisions for many peoples, and they will hammer their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. That hasn't happened yet, but it is going to happen in the future. And this psalm looks to that when the king comes, and there is, he will establish it forever. Now turn to chapter 4 of Isaiah, verse 2. It says, in that day the branch of the Lord, well we could turn to Jeremiah and see that the branch is Messiah, but we don't have time, will be a beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and adornment of the survivors of Israel. And it will come about that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy, everyone who is recorded for life in Jerusalem. When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst, 
by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. Then the Lord will create over the whole great Mount Zion and over the assemblies a cloud by day, even smoke and the brightness of the flaming fire by night, for over all the glory will be a canopy. Now, fire by night and a covering by day reminds you of Exodus, doesn't it? Well, in the millennium, there will be that over Jerusalem. And there, verse 6, and there will be a shelter to shade from the heat by day and a refuge and protection from the storm and the rain. Uh, well, that had not happened yet, has it? <laughs> but it's going to happen. One more time, if you would allow me to indulge myself, in turning to Zechariah chapter 14. Yes, one of the minor prophets there. In the 14th chapter, we find um, them talking about the second coming of Christ. Uh, notice, uh, let's see, 14.4, And in that day, his feet, speaking about Messiah, will stand on Mount of Olives, which is in the front of Jerusalem on the east, and on the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will be removed toward the north and half of it toward the south. So that hasn't happened yet, okay? You can still see the Mount of Olives and it's still intact, all right? Um, then verse 8 is really I want to get to. When that time, when that splitting of the mountain and Christ's coming is with his feet on the Mount of Olives, it, and it will come about in that day that living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the east sea uh, and half toward the western Mediterranean sea. And it will be in the summer as, as in the winter. Well, there is no water coming out of there now, is there? Uh, if you want to read more about it, you have to go to Ezekiel, chapters right around 46 through uh, 48. But verse 9 of this text of Zechariah 14, And the Lord will be king over all the earth in that day. The Lord will be the only one, and his name will be the only one. And then notice verse 16 and 17. Then it will come about that any who are left in all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. And it will be that which, uh, whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. So, uh, interesting text uh, of, of Zechariah looking to the future when, as this psalm says in Psalm 48, verse 8, God will establish her forever. It's not yet, but it's to become in the future. And this psalm, David believed it, and, uh, or uh, the, the song of Korah's, the people believed it and are expressing that truth by just a little phrase, and God will establish her forever. All right? So the victory for Zion doesn't look like it today, but it is coming. Now, the final section in verses 9 through 14 Praise be to God throughout the earth because of his loyal love, his righteousness, and his judgment, judgments as he dwells in Zion among his people forever and guides them until death. So the psalmist, the psalmist is looking toward that time we just read about in Zechariah, of uh, the time when it will be established. They believed that eschatology, the future things, 
had a great deal to do with how you live today. It's not just, oh, well, high pie in the sky sometime, this is going to happen, it has nothing to do to me at present. If we believe it, we live different. And this psalm is bringing this out. Now, the three characteristics of, of God that deserves praise we see in this text, verse 9. And we have thought on your loving kindness, O God. Yeah, that's my favorite term, chesed, the, that covenantal, loyal love that God gives, love that is given to Israel, and he has given to the church today. So, in your temple, we think about your loyal love. We have thought on your loyal love, O God, in the midst of your temple. And then, in verse 10, we see his righteousness uh, elevated. As is your name, O God, so is your praise to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is full of righteousness. So they anticipate one day, and it will happen, that righteousness will be throughout the land, throughout the earth, to the ends of the earth. His right hand is full of righteousness. That's why Jesus had to come, didn't he? And die on the cross, was buried and rose again, because no one can get to heaven unless you're just as righteous as Jesus is righteous. And people say, whew, well then nobody's going to get there. Well, precisely unless by his mercy and grace, he imputes to us, he sets down to our account the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that's what happens when we, we believe that Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. We receive the righteousness of Christ. The, we are imputed that. We are set down to our account, righteous. It's not our righteousness. It's his righteousness on our behalf. Then in verse 11, let Mount Zion be glad, let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Ultimately, we will even praise God for his judgment because his judgment will demonstrate part of his character. So notice, they are praising God uh, for his, and it's an eternal praise, for three characteristics, his loyal love, his royal loyal love, his chesed, his righteousness, sadiq, and his judgments to come. And secondly, in verses 12 through 14, a testimony to the next generation. Okay? It's not just for their generation. It's for the next generation. Notice, walk about in Zion. They could do that. And go around about her. Count her towers. Consider her ramparts. Go through the palaces that you may tell it to the next generation. Not to brag about, look how great we are, look at the buildings and all this magnificent thing, but to brag about God who did these things. In other words, he's trying to say to them, observe the city. Notice what God has allowed us to do to protect ourselves. But it's, don't look to the buildings. Look to the God who allowed us to build the buildings. When we're at war, don't look at our war treasure and our, uh, uh, all that we have to make war, but look to the God who has given this equipment to us who will give us the victory. So see how dangerous that is? We, are to, we should look around, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about, okay, a Jewish person. Look around Jerusalem. Look at all that God has done. And, but the danger is that you only look at the physical instead of what the God who did this physical thing. So he's saying, go throughout the city. Marvel at it. Not at that which is physical but the physical should remind you of the spiritual, of the God who did these things. Now, the same thing could be said about your family, right? 
You could say, well, look what God has done for my family. Or you could say, well, see, we got a house, we got this, we got a retirement, we got this, we got that. And as you tell your grandkids, as you tell your children, no. You, you, you tell them that God has done See this? Oh, yeah, Grandpa, I see that. Or, oh, yeah, I see that, Dad. Well, it's not because of me. It's because of the God who did this. So you could go around your whole a house and anything you have and and remind them that the physical is not the key it should remind us who gave it to us same about our country isn't it i was um i completely um blown away as a young person and as con continue to grow up as adult as I went around Washington, D.C., of how many places where Scripture is placed. Uh, everywhere in that city. Now, you can go through that city and see all of, of the magnificent buildings and statutes uh, of, of the place and, and completely um, miss the Scripture. Okay, or you could do just the other way of somebody showing you the scriptures or those uh, uh, things reminding us of the scriptures. Matter of fact, you can't walk, walk into the uh, uh, Supreme Court without looking at the Ten Commandments and Moses. It, I, I think uh, Ted Cruz said there's 18 times I think of Moses or the scriptures involved just in the building of the Supreme Court. So that's what he's trying to say here in this text. Consider the ramparts, consider all those things. Why? Because it should remind you what God has done. And then finally, notice verse 14, two important testimonies for the next generation. For God, for such as God, as you go around and, 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 and show people of Jerusalem, you should say, such is God. Our God is forever and ever. It's throughout eternity. In other words, we ought to think about the God of eternity. And then another reminder. Notice God first. Upward first, and then he makes the reminder at the end to us down on the earth, he will guide us until death. The God of eternity for which we should praise him uh, forever and ever is the God who will be with you until you go home. Until death. What a magnificent psalm to remind us how we should be walking then with our eyes of everything we see physical should cause our eyes to go upward. To remind us about God for He has promised to guide us until we go home. Until death. What a great text of Scripture for the season that we are now we are living in. So if I had to put in one sentence, which is difficult, Psalm 48, the Lord God is worthy of all praise because He has made Zion the joy of all the earth, and his loyal love, righteousness, and judgment in Zion testify of his victory over the enemy, the eternality of God, and his guidance until death. And that possible one application of many. The Lord God is worthy of eternal praise and worth testifying to the next generation. Because he gives victory and guidance until we die. 
Well, Psalm 48 is fast becoming one of my favorites. I, I guess I'm like J. Vernon McGee. Every passage, every psalm becomes my favorite. Well, let me pray, men, and then you can ask your questions and comments. Lord, thank you for this psalm. My heart is thrilled, Lord, of the great and, and wonderful things that you have done, Lord. And the reminder uh, uh, of the psalm that everything we see should be a testimony of the greatness of our God. So we entrust our lives into your hands, O oh God. May we re be, uh, be reminded that you will guide us until we die. And therefore we should have worthy of your praise until, uh, because of what you have done. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.